car crash cases, defective products, dangerous drugs, injuries, and abuse. Across the state of Alabama, the attorneys, proudly sponsored by the law firm of Hollis Wright, are here to serve you. Your tough legal questions answered by our experts. The attorneys with Josh Wright from the law firm of Hollis Wright and host David Lamb. Good evening and welcome into the attorneys. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We've got a panel of experts ready to deal with the topic that we believe will be of interest to a whole lot of us. It's property disputes. So uh, if you have not gone through that up to this point, chances are in the future you very well might. So our, our guest tonight is an expert in that and it's going to be a really interesting conversation. Before we jump into that, a reminder how you can join the conversation. All that information on your screen plus Hollis Wright makes available each and every Sunday night. Attorneys from the firm standing by live to speak with you. That's a free confidential and off air conversation. So don't miss that opportunity. Leading tonight's conversation from Hollis Wright, Carter Clay. Good to see you, sir. Good to see you, David. I hope you're doing well. Doing well. How are you? I'm doing great. Yeah, I don't know how much leading I'm going to be doing tonight <laughs> because I was thinking before we got started about the legal topic that we're going to cover here this evening. And as you know, at Hollis Wright, we're a personal injury right. law firm representing individuals who have been injured in accidents. And tonight we're going to be talking about property rights. Right. So this is pretty far off the spectrum of, of being in my wheelhouse, but <laughs> we're going to be talking about uh, deeds and we're going to be using some archaic kind of terminology and language, but our guest does a really good job of simplifying of these principles and issues so that the viewers will be able to understand it. But when you think about buying a piece of property or selling a piece of property, what is it that you're buying exactly? What is it that you're selling? How to reduce it to a written document to make sure that everybody on the universe or everybody in America knows that that is your particular piece of property. Right. There's a lot of details that go into that. What do you do if you own property with multiple people? How do you create, uh, draft the documentation to show who owns what? And that's essentially what we're going to be talking about. We're also going to be talking about property uh, owners' disputes with other people who may make claim to their property because, David, this might surprise you. There are people out there that might try and sell a piece of property to somebody when they actually don't own the piece of property. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's crazy. So Jackie Wesson is going to be here with us this evening. She's been on the show before. Thank you so much for uh, being here with us tonight to uh, share your views and knowledge on property rights. I'm very glad to be here. Tell the viewers a little bit about your background and your legal practice. Sure. My husband and I actually are both attorneys. We have a practice there in Warrior. We end up going to uh, counties all over, Blount County, Coleman, Jefferson, St. Clair, you name it, we're there. We, uh, it's just a two-person operation, but we have a very varied practice. We call it our Atticus Finch practice. It's a, a nice country law firm. We see a lot of different things, including a lot of real property disputes. So it's a good practice. Well, when we talk about property rights, my knee-jerk reaction is, is it seems like everything starts with a deed. That's correct. I think most people have heard that term before. If they've owned a house or a piece of property, they got a deed for it, correct? Absolutely. But it's not quite that simple because there are different types of deeds. There are. When you receive property, you receive it typically in Alabama through one of three types of deeds. The first is a quick claim deed. A quick claim deed is the lowest quality deed because it doesn't guarantee anything to the person who's receiving the property. If I give property to you by a quick claim deed, I'm not representing even that I own it. But what I am representing to you that whatever I do own, you can have now. But if I have nothing to give, then you receive nothing. So it is a deed that has no guarantees as to what my title is, what rights I have in the property. The second type of deed in Alabama that is sort of an intermediate type deed is regarding the uh, warranties that are involved is a statutory warranty deed. A statutory warranty deed is a deed that says I do have title to this property and I'm going to convey it to you and I have done nothing to encumber the property or to create liens against the property since I've had it. And that's typically, we'll see that used frequently with, for example, a personal representative, someone who represents an estate. They have received property as part of the estate and they're going to be conveying it to a, a devisee or a beneficiary. And in doing so, what they're conveying is whatever the, the title to the property and ensuring I don't have any encumbrances that I've created. The last type of deed that can be used to convey property in Alabama, or the most frequently used one, is the general warranty deed. 
General warranty deed conveys the highest quality title in Alabama. It uh, conveys to the property owner that's receiving the property all the right and title that I have, and not only am I conveying that title, I'm telling you that I have good title. I have title that is marketable. Not only did I not incur liens or encumbrances, but there are no liens or encumbrances against this property. And I will defend this title not only against uh, any, my heirs or myself or anyone that might make a claim, but against anyone who might make a claim against it. Now, what type of deed would we be talking about if I were to go out and buy a house? Would I get a general warranty You would deed? absolutely want a general warranty okay. deed. You would want that because it's the highest quality title. It ensures you that the person that's conveying you that property to you is warranting that title for against these defects. And the quit claim deed, I was thinking to myself, why would anybody pay money for a quit claim deed? There's no guarantees. They're not even making any representations that they own it. Can you give me some examples? And Sometimes. is that something that's still used today, really? It really is. And we most frequently will see those in, say, for example, a divorce. One spouse has already been divested of any interest in the property by uh, virtue of an order, but in order for there to be a clear chain of title that a title company could examine and review, the courts will obligate that one person who was divested of any interest to execute a quick claim deed. That puts that link in the chain, so to say, the chain of title, so that if a uh, title abstractor later comes back to review that title, they see that, in fact, that property was conveyed by a divorced spouse to the remaining spouse. Yeah, and title insurance seems to always be part of the closing on a house. Title insurance is very important. We recommend that people have title insurance. You can there, you can get something less than that. You can get a title report. A title report will simply give you an idea of what is out there with regard to the title of a property. Title insurance is more than that. Title insurance is a title company that is guaranteeing that the title company is free of any defects other than what they've identified. They do a title title search, they look to see if there are any encumbrances, was there an old mortgage, was there a deed, was there a time when there was a lapse in the uh, conveyance from one party to, uh, party to another. When they do that, they, are, they will then insure that title, and it's a very valuable type of insurance. Now we're going to talk specifically about these two different concepts when we come back, but if you have multiple owners like a husband and a wife or just multiple people buying a piece of property, what are the two types of ways they can own the property? Right. That's going to be by joint tenants with right of survivorship or by tenants in common. And those two methods of holding property vary in what happens to it in the event of the death of one of the owners. All right, when we return from the break, I want to talk about those two different ways to own property, the advantages and disadvantages of doing that, okay? Very good. Good spot to step aside. We're taking our first break of the evening. As we do so, hey, I want to tell you about Hollis Wright's uh, social media presence all over Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. You can find them there. A great informational, educational resource and a great, great way to kind of keep up with uh, what's going on at Hollis Wright and great way to engage them as well. All right, we're taking a break. We're coming back. More of the attorneys coming back right after this quick break. I'm Josh Wright with the law firm of Hollis Wright, a personal injury law firm. Thank you for watching the attorneys. Now we hope you, a friend, or a loved one never needs legal counsel for a case. But if you do, the goal of the show is simple. Provide answers and legal counsel when you need it the most. Your call to the show is free, so if you have questions specific to the show or related to other accident or injury related topics, you can call, email, or text us. Or you can also follow us on Facebook or Twitter, or simply contact us by going to hollis-right.com and click on the Contact Us link. We know your time is valuable, so thank you for spending it with us watching The Attorneys.
Welcome back into the attorneys. Appreciate you being with us and making us a part of your Sunday evening. Before we head back to the conversation with Carter and Jackie, just a reminder, attorneys from Hollis Wright standing by this segment and the next segment and then done. So if you want uh, uh, that opportunity, take advantage of the opportunity to speak with an actual attorney standing by live. Don't forget to do that. And you got a few minutes to do so. Carter. Yeah, Jackie, let's talk a little bit about joint tenants with right of survivorship. That's a, a fancy uh, legal term, but exactly what does that mean? And in your practice, what context do you typically see that in? Right. Joint tenants with right of survivorship. When I receive property via a deed and I'm not the only owner, then I have a couple of options for how to hold that property. Most frequently, for example, with spouses, that property is going to be held as joint tenants with right of survivorship. And the effect of that is that in the event something happens to one or the other owners, uh, the all of that person's interest, of, if the person died, for example, their interest would go automatically to the surviving spouse. <clears throat> that way there's nothing that has to be probated. It's effectuated immediately upon someone's death, and the full interest is owned then by the surviving spouse, if you're talking about in that context. And I guess if, if that <clears throat> happened, I guess at some point the the spouse who survived would become the sole owner and then they would have to probably draft some paperwork to become officially 100% sole owner of the right. property. Actually, the, it's automatic because okay. of the way that the property is held as joint tenants with right of survivorship. Nothing has to be done. Okay. Now, in order to clear up if you were transferring later on, normally what has happened is we will do a, an heirs affidavit to let someone know if I owned it as a joint tenant that the uh, other tenant has died and therefore I own all of it now. Now the alternative to that is tenants in common. When property is held as tenants in common, this is frequently seen if you have, for example, a couple of friends. Say you had a couple of fellows who wanted to buy a hunting uh, So spot. you, me, and David. Right. The that. three of us are going to we're gonna go up here and we're going to purchase some property. Well, I don't necessarily say if each of us is going to contribute equally. I don't necessarily want my portion in the event something happens to me to go to 100% to the two of you. Not that I have anything against y'all, but, sure. <laughs> but I want it to pass to my heirs or to my uh, beneficiaries or devisees, whoever I name in a will. So if we own that property as tenants in common, that's what would happen. My portion in the event something happened to me would pass according to my will, if I have a will, or to my heirs at law, if I don't. Is there a way that the three of us, if we went into that type of, of business arrangement, can you put like a buyout provision in there where it would basically say if you own a third and you pass away, we would automatically have to pay I guess the fair market value for your one third and then that would actually be cash that would go into your estate? It would be. You can enter into a separate agreement that would govern that and normally that's outside the context of the deed. The deed itself will re record what our ownership interest is and what in what portions as well as the nature of the way we held the deed, for example, as tenants in common. But we could certainly have an, an additional agreement that would bind our heirs as far as how we would handle that property. And I guess if it's joint tenant with right of survivorship or tenants in common, this is something that's decided before the closing on the property. It's There's paperwork that would be drafted that would spell all of this Absolutely, out. Absolutely, because this language is actually included within the deed that conveys the property. Okay. Uh, one question we've got here, if I own real property, do I still have to pay taxes on it? You do. Normally in Alabama, you absolutely do have to pay property taxes. Those are known as our ad valorem real property taxes. The county tax assessor is the one who sets the valuation on the property and that determines the amount of the tax. There are times when you do not have to pay, uh, pay property tax. If you have a homestead and you are 65 years of age or older, if you are disabled or if you are blind, then you are exempt from having to pay those property taxes. It's not an automatic exemption though, it's one that has to be claimed. So it's important for someone who meets that criteria when they receive their tax card to claim that exemption so that they're not obligated to pay. If also, if you are a person who is assisting someone who is of that age or who has a disability, then that's something to sort of consider in sort of making sure that their financial house is in order. Let's make certain that that exemption is claimed for that person because it's lost if, it, if you don't uh, claim it. Right. One other thing, if you have a mortgage, typically the uh, how the mortgage the lender will require that the taxes are escrowed so that each month they collect a small portion in addition to the house payment and put it in a special account so that it can be paid at the end of the year for the taxes. 
it's important as a homeowner that you are making certain that the mortgage, the lender, the mortgagee has the information about the taxes and that they are being paid each year. Yeah, I, I guess there have been some horror tales about people thinking it's an escrow and it's going to get paid and then mm -hmm. it doesn't get paid and then they get a big bill from the municipality or Absolutely. the county and, and, and that can that can be a nightmare so it's a simple way to check the information is typically available online or a call to the county uh, county tax assessor but it's imperative that the homeowner ultimately make certain that that tax is paid talk a little bit about foreclosures on a property i know that that's something that is is probably very important uh, to people out there who have gone through that process before who are unable to make their mortgage payments what happens in a foreclosure process and is the homeowner allowed in alabama to redeem that property or get it back yes in alabama we have what's called a non-judicial foreclosure which means that the lender who is foreclosing in the event of a default does not have to go to court in order to foreclose on that property what they will typically do is notify the homeowner of a deficiency or a default. They will publish that information in a, a newspaper of general circulation for about three weeks, for, not for about, but for three weeks, and then they will hold a foreclosure sale, literally auctioning the property on the stairs of the courthouse between the hours of 11 and 4. Uh, old those, school. Old don't, school. Don't use computers Stand right there now. And, and, and call out on the stairs. The um, and once that happens, the foreclosure is effectuated. Assuming everything's been done properly, that's the end of the foreclosure process. The person who has whose home has been foreclosed on does have a right to redeem it. The legislature recently shortened that period. If it's a homestead, it's only 180 days. So that's an important consideration. There's very little time, and it's expensive. You have to pay for the purchase amount on the foreclosure sale, insurance, taxes, any permanent improvements that were made, and a few other ex uh, fees and expenses. So it's not an, uh, an inexpensive process, but it is possible to get the property back. And what is homestead? Homestead means I live there. It's where I, where I am living. It's not a second home. It's not something where I have an additional piece of property where it's just a vacant piece of property, but it has to be my homestead. And can you lose the right to redeem your property? Uh, is there somewhere in the provision where if you don't vacate the premises when there, they tell you to? Absolutely. Once you receive notice that the foreclosure has occurred, then you're, you have an opportunity to get out of the, vacate the premises, and you have to do so within 10 days. The failure of a person to do that waives that right of redemption, so it's critical that if you think you might want to redeem, that you vacate those premises as soon as possible. All right, how about if we uh, step aside? Sounds good. All right, good time to take a break. We're gonna take our final break of the evening. We're coming back, Jackie and Carter, are gonna wrap things up and take us home here on this show. But as we head to break, wanna remind you how you could join our conversation. You got a few minutes remaining, so uh, don't miss out. A few minutes remaining here on The Attorneys. Stay tuned, one final segment coming right up with Jackie and Carter and you. We'll be right back. I'm attorney Carter Clay with Hollis Wright Law Firm. If you've ever been involved in a civil lawsuit or been a witness to an accident, then you may have been asked to give deposition testimony. In this week's Legal 411, we are answering the question, what is a deposition and why am I being asked to give one? Depositions involve the process of a person giving under oath testimony that is outside of court. The person giving deposition testimony is referred to as the deponent. Depositions are taken in the presence of a court reporter and the court reporter records the testimony. After the deposition, the attorneys for the parties received a typed transcript that contains all the questions that were asked by the attorneys as well as the answers given by the deponent. The purpose of taking depositions is to ensure that the attorneys for the parties have a full and complete understanding of the events giving rise to the lawsuit as well as an understanding of the testimony that they can expect to hear from witnesses at trial. Another reason an attorney might want to get deposition testimony is that it allows the attorneys to better prepare for trial and to develop a strategy for presenting the case to a judge or a jury. At trial, the deposition testimony can be used in several ways. First, if a witness on the stand deviates from the deposition testimony, an attorney can use the deposition to impeach the witness. Also, if a witness forgets certain facts or events, the deposition can be used to refresh the witness's recollection. 
Finally, in some instances when a witness simply cannot attend trial, the trial judge has the authority to allow the deposition testimony to be read to the jury. If you are a party to a lawsuit and are requested to give deposition testimony, your attorney will likely spend a significant amount of time preparing you for the deposition process to put you at ease and make you feel comfortable. Please remember your call, email, or text to the attorneys is free. All of us at Hollis Wright want to help answer your questions on real issues you face. Remember, a competent lawyer will respond to every question you send in. That's our pledge and promise to you. Thanks for watching the attorneys on WVTM 13. Welcome back into the attorneys. Just about seven minutes or so remaining in the show. We're almost out of time. So if you want to speak with uh, those attorneys standing by live, take advantage of that opportunity. But first, let's head back to Jackie and Carter. Yeah, Jackie, I've, I've heard of and actually had situations in my practice over the years involving, it seems like it generally happens with elderly people where they actually uh, transfer the ownership of their house or property to a family member or a loved one, but they maintain a right to live in it until they die. Uh, is that something that you're familiar with? What is that called it, and how do you go about doing that? It is, we, we frequently see that in our practice that people would like to go ahead and transfer ownership of property, but they don't wanna divest themselves of it. They wanna still have the certainty, I have a place to live for as long as I live. And what we will sometimes do in that circumstance, if, it, if it's a good fit, is to transfer the property via a life estate so that the person who is giving it maintains a life estate. It means that if I'm giving my property to you, I get to keep the property for the entirety of my life and any remainder interest at the time of my death, the property goes to you. And it can be to a family member or a non-family member. There are pluses and minuses to doing this, and that's one of the things that we encourage people to consider. One of the most significant is it can't be undone. If I decide to leave you property by will, then I can change that whenever I choose right. to. But the conveyance of property by with my reserving a life estate for myself takes place at the time of the conveyance, and I no longer own that remainder interest and so I can't do anything with it. The other thing is it limits what I would be able to do with the property uh, while I live there. I can live there but I can't commit waste. I can't do anything that would diminish the value of the property. I could use the timber on the property for my personal use but I couldn't harvest it for sale because that would impair your interest if you were receiving that remainder. So. And what would be, if you're already living in the house and you already own the house, what would be the reason you would want to do this? Some people just want the certainty that it's going to a particular person. They want that person to go ahead and know. Rather than it being a gift at the time of their death, it's a gift that's made during their life, but that only comes to, ripens to full fruition at the time of their death. And, and the person that they're transferring the property to, they don't have the authority or have rights to like, uh, encumber the property do they? they can't go out and get a second mortgage that's correct they cannot and so they can and so there are some protections for the person who's living there but there are also protections for the person who is going to be receiving it okay. question we've got here if I own a, pre a piece of real property with someone else and no longer want to own the property with that person do I have any rights to divest myself of any interest in the property absolutely and we see this not infrequently where, I bet. Uh, yeah. where you have two people who own property together and and they just do not want to own property together anymore. And there are ways to get around that. There are options for partitioning, and that's the term used when you want to go to court and ask the court to um, do a partition either uh, in kind or by sale. Now, before we get to that point, we encourage people, let's see if we can reach an agreement. Can the two of you agree that one will buy out the other's interest or that the property will be sold and the proceeds divided? But there are times when those agreements can't be right. obtained. And in those situations, that partition is the court option that's available. A partition in kind means the court, they look at a piece of property and the judge decides, I can divide this property reasonably equally, just physically divide it. Mm -hmm. One acre to you, one to you. When that's not possible because of the topography or the geography of the land, then the court may instead say, I can't do it in kind, but I will do it by sale. We're going to sell it and then divide the proceeds according to the individual rights in the property. Do all conveyances or sales of real property, do they have to involve a written contract in Alabama? 
they do. You have to have a written contract, and that's requ required under what we call our statute of frauds. The written contract requirement means that if I am c going to do a conveyance and I'm going to contract for that conveyance, that has to be in writing. There is one exception. It's an interesting exception, and that's called part performance. If I have, if we have contracted verbally, and I have put you in possession of the property, you have given me uh, some money towards that property, that's part performance. And that becomes an enforceable contract even though it was only verbal. So, If a viewer out there wants to get information about a particular piece of property, the history of the property, wh where are these records maintained in the state of Alabama so that the viewer could go look at these uh, records? In Alabama, all conveyances, all interests in property, not only a conveyance of an outright title, but a conveyance as far as a mortgage or a lien, those have to be recorded, and they're recorded with the judge of probate in each county. So the probate records department maintains those. If you go to the, um, if you go to a title abstractor, and a title abstractor is a professional who examines titles, they will do what's called a grantor grantee search, where they look through property to see, you know, what was the, has this grantor, if this grantor holds it now, who held it before this person? Who? transferred it to them. So those records are maintained in each probate court in every county. And is it the probate court in the county where the property is located? Great question. It is. It's in the county where the property is located. And so it's a very good thing to do to check for liens or any sort of encumbrance with that uh, Probate court. So there's really a wealth of information you can find in those files. Tremendous amount of information. Good to know. All right, uh, just a couple of minutes remaining. Um, we want to give both of you the opportunity for a final thought. Jackie, if you would, you go first, please. Well, I think that one of the things that's important is that you make certain that you know what you own. I mean, there is a way to do that, and one thing is by having a title company examine title as you're in the process of receiving it, that you have a survey conducted by a professional surveyor so that you know where the boundaries are to your property. One of the benefits to having a survey, a new survey done is that you clean up a legal description. Many legal descriptions and some property disputes that we've handled have been where you had uh, a description that might have relied on a, a tree trunk or a rock being located in a particular. Oh, now the surveyors are using GPS and it provides yeah. a much more definite statement. Cardinal. Yeah, and I think this is one of those areas of law where you don't want to take anything for granted. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is, is how many times have we bought a house where we just go in and we just sign on the dotted line with the closing attorney, we don't ask a lot of questions. And that is a recipe for real problems. When you're buying real property, whether it's undeveloped property or a house where you're gonna have a mortgage, do your due diligence, do some research, whether it's on the internet or calling somebody like Jackie and just asking a simple question to make sure that you have all the information and that you are actually purchasing what you think you're purchasing and that you're getting the warranty for the deed that you think you're getting. That's a good advice and a good note to end it on. Appreciate you both being with us. Jackie, good to see you again. Great to be here. And Carter, thanks for being with us Thank as well. Thank you, David. Good deal. We're uh, wrapping this one up, but as we do so, and kind of wrap things up from here, uh, Hollis Wright returns every text, phone call, email. Even though the show's going off the air, they'll still do that. So if there's a, a question you have and you want to get it to them, go ahead, take advantage of those opportunities. We're so grateful uh, for you joining us each and every week. As always, thanks so much. We'll see you next time right here on The Attorneys. Thanks for watching The Attorneys, sponsored by Hollis Wright.